further along the Peter Principle. In a previous work, The Peter Principle and the Keys to the Kingdom, I both demonstrated that certain New Testament figures have parabolic significance and detailed how I was able to arrive at their proper interpretation. Peter, for example, can almost invariably be read as the church, because in Matthew 16, 17 through 19, Jesus named Simon, son of John, Peter, which means rock, as a function of his listening to Jesus' Father in heaven. The name Rock is attributed to Simon not because of who he was, but because listening to the Father makes a person securely founded and strong like a rock. So that when Jesus says in verse 18, And I say to you that you are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, we understand that the church is not founded on the basis of apostolic succession, because that would be mixing up cause and effect. Simon is called a rock as an effect of his spiritual intuition. So if the church is to be founded on this rock, then the cause is still the spiritual intuition that is a function of listening to the Father. His both Peter and the church share the same cause and effect relationship, and can therefore be seen as interchangeable. The only reason that the church seems to be subordinate to Peter is because Peter is an individual, but the church is a corporate body of believers. And hence, when we speak of the church as being founded upon the rock, it is because the many persons within that body are each, like Peter, a rock. And hence, the church is built upon the multitude of believers who, like Peter, together form a rock. Other figures have related functions as well. Jesus, for example, can be interpreted as the Word, since we read in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14 we read, And the Word became flesh, which lets us know that Jesus is actually God. Jesus also means the Word. The Word is, in fact, Jesus' flesh. The Word refers to Jesus, and Jesus signifies the Word. And the Word also refers to the flesh, and the flesh also signifies the Word. When we see the word Jesus, we can translate it as the word. And when we see Jesus referring to his flesh, we know that he is referring to his word as well. From these few simple facts, we can derive an unlimited number of other insights. When, for example, Jesus breaks the bread and tells his disciples that it is his flesh that is being broken for them, he is actually telling them that his word is going to be torn apart for their sakes. Also, since we see that Jesus is synonymous with the word in parabolic language, the interplay between Peter and Jesus becomes the interplay between the church and the word throughout church history. Making his denials of Jesus really mean his rejection of the word of God through the ages as well. The figures of James and John can be derived from the scriptures also, but in a more complicated way. In Matthew 17, 1 through 13, we read that Jesus takes Peter, the church, and James and John up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured before them. Now we already understand that Jesus represents the word of God, and Peter represents the church. So when Jesus transfigures before them, why do Moses and Elijah appear? John 1, 17 says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Through this observation, we can say that Moses represents the Old Testament here, and naturally enough, Jesus in this context would represent the New Testament, and Elijah would represent some other testament. Furthermore, since Peter represents the church, we know that James and John likewise each represent some other kind of congregation. One of the two ought to correspond to the Old Testament and therefore represent the Jewish people. This idea is further reinforced by Peter himself when he says in verse 4, Lord, it is good that we are here. Would you like me to make three tabernacles here? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? In other words, the church would like to preserve itself through recognizing themselves, the Jews, and the other congregation as separate entities, each with its own ideas about worshiping God. But Mark 9.6 lets us know that it is only through the church's own ignorance and fear that it suggests this by saying, For he, Peter, knew not what to answer, for they became sore afraid. 
A little bit later, the disciples asked Jesus why Elijah must precede Jesus, the words rising from the dead. And Jesus replies in verse 11 through 13, Elijah is to come and set everything right. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they failed to recognize him, and did to him as they wanted. In the same way, the Son of Man is to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he meant John the Baptist. So we can see that Elijah here represents John the Baptist. But what about James and John? Well, Jesus tells us about two Elijahs, one that is coming and the other that has come. The one that has come was John the Baptist, who was murdered. The one who is to come will be the one who is to set everything right. Since Moses represents the Old Testament and Jesus the New, Elijah represents a testament that will set everything right, functioning, as it were, as a corrective testament. But if this is so, then why the parallel between the one to come and John the Baptist? It is fitting that Elijah should serve a double function here, because he represents a testament that was both destroyed and is to come. There is only one answer to the question of what scriptures were once cut off, the apocryphal books. So these are to be restored at the end of the age. When Jesus, who represents the word of God, will be raised from the dead, no one, not the Jews, nor the Christians, nor even the elect, who are to come and restore the apocryphal books at the end of the age, will understand these things until this mystery is revealed. So we see the pattern that is to come. There will be three testaments which will become one, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books of the Old and New Testaments. Since Peter represents the Christians, and James and John represent the Jews and the elect, who are to come, the only thing that remains to be seen is which apostle represents which testament. John lets us know in chapter 20, verses 20 through 22, that it is none other than himself that is to be the Elijah that is to come and set everything right by saying, Peter looked around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, following, the one who at supper leaned back close to him to ask the question, Lord, who is it that will betray you? When he saw him, Peter, the church, asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus said, If it be my will that he stay until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So if John represents the elect, then James, his brother, represents the Jews. In the Peter Principle, I detailed virtually all of these things, and I demonstrated these principles primarily through the four Gospels. But I also mentioned that these keys would work in the Apocryphal Gospels. It is indeed one thing to come to these conclusions through logic, but it is quite another to put them to the test. If the things that I am saying were untrue, I can't see why they would work at all. But if the things that I'm saying work all the time, then it is indeed a wonder. But I know that they do work, and I am not the least bit afraid to put them to the test. I will devote the remainder of this work to the decoding of a complete apocryphal book. When I am done, I hope you will have a profound sense of what it is like to truly understand the scriptures. That the same principles are operating in both the canonical and the apocryphal writings, and that both are equally inspired. The book that I will be interpreting is called The Secret Book of James. It is a rebuke of Jesus directed at Peter and James, the church and the Jews. And it talks about those who will be saved through faith in this discourse. And it also says that Jesus promised them, the Jews and Christians, life and has disclosed to them children who are to come after. This book itself claims to be obscure to both Christians and Jews because it ends by saying, for apart from what I have recounted, the Savior did not disclose revelation to us. For their sake we proclaim, indeed a portion with those for whom it was proclaimed, those whom the Lord has made his children. Those who are to come after are the elect ones. The Secret Book of James James writes to you, Peace be with you from peace, love from love, grace from grace, faith from faith, and life from holy life. Since you asked me to send you a secret book which was revealed to me and Peter, that is, the Jews and the Christians across time to the elect, by the Lord, I could neither refuse you nor speak directly to you. 
He could not refuse because it was meant for those to come, and he could not speak directly because he had been commanded to encode it with these keys. But I have written it to you in Hebrew letters, and have sent it to you and to you alone, meaning by Hebrew that James signifies the Jews, and to you alone means that only the ones whose hearts have been prepared by God could understand it. But inasmuch as you are a minister of the salvation of the saints, endeavor earnestly to take care not to recount this book to many, this which the Savior did not desire to recount to all of us, his twelve disciples. But blessed are those who will be saved through faith in this discourse, the elect who will interpret it. Now I sent to you ten months ago another secret book which the Savior revealed to me, but that one you are to regard in this manner, as revealed to me, James, the Jews alone in all likelihood, rather than to James and Peter, meaning that what was then revealed pertained only to the Jews, but this is directed against both the Jews and the Christians. Now the twelve disciples were sitting all together at the same time, and remembering what the Savior had said to each one of them, whether secretly or openly, they were setting it down in books. And I was writing what was in my book. Lo, the Savior appeared after he had departed from, and while we were watching for him. And so, five hundred and fifty days after he arose from the dead, we said to him, Have you gone and departed from us? And Jesus said, No, but I shall go to the place from which I have come. If you desire to come with me, come. They all answered him and said, If you bid us, we'll come. He said, Truly I say to you, no one will ever enter the kingdom of heaven if I bid him, but rather because you yourselves are full of the Spirit. Let me have James and Peter, the Jews in the church, in order that I may fill them. And when he called these two, he took them aside and commanded the rest to busy themselves with that with which they had been busy. The Savior said, You have received mercy. Do you not desire then to be filled with the Spirit? And is your heart drunk? Do you not desire then to be sober? Therefore, be ashamed. And now, waking or sleeping, remember that you have seen the Son of Man, and with him you have spoken, and to him you have listened. Woe to those who have seen the Son of Man. Blessed are those who have not seen the Son of Man, and who have not consorted with him, and who have not spoken with him, and who have not listened to anything from him. Yours is life. In other words, it is the Jews and the Christians who will bear the brunt of his anger at his return, and those who were not given the knowledge will then understand him as he should have been understood all along. Know therefore that he healed you when you were ill, in order that you might reign. Woe to those who have rested from their illness, because they will relapse again into illness. The illness is religion. Blessed are those who have not been ill and have known rest, the truth about the kingdom, the mystery. Before they became ill, yours is the kingdom of God. Therefore I say to you, become full of the Spirit, and leave no place within you empty, since the coming one is able to mock you with the scriptures. Then Peter, the church, answered and said, Lord, three times you have said to us, Become full, but we are full. The three times correspond to the church's three denials of the Apocrypha, the 4th, 17th, and 21st centuries. The Lord answered and said, Therefore I say to you, Become full of the Spirit, in order that you may not become diminished in the Spirit. Those who are spiritually diminished will not be saved, for fullness of spirit is good, and diminution in spirit is bad. Therefore, just as it is good for you to be diminished in reason, and on the other hand, bad for you to be filled with reason, so also the one who is full of reason is diminished in spirit. And the one who is diminished in spirit is not filled spiritually, as one who is diminished of reason is filled spiritually and the one who is full of the spirit for his part brings his sufficiency to completion therefore it is fitting to be diminished of reason while you can still be filled with the spirit and to be filled with the spirit while it is still possible to be diminished of reason
in order that you can fill yourselves the more spiritually. Therefore become full of the Spirit, but diminished of reason, for reason is of the soul, and it is soul. And I answered and said to him, Lord, we can't obey you if you wish, for we have forsaken our forefathers and our mothers and our villages and have followed you. Grant us, therefore, not to be tempted by the wicked devil. The Lord answered and said, What is your merit when you do the will of the Father if it is not given to you by him as a gift while you are tempted by Satan? The church, and to a lesser extent the Jews of the early church, would have liked to have been delivered from Satan's clutches. The Jews fell prey to the devil because they could not accept a Messiah who did not rescue them from the Romans. And the church fell prey because she could not accept the word of God in its entirety. Both seem convinced of their own righteousness, but Jesus lets them know that God will rectify both dilemmas, but as a gift, while they are caught in their errors, being tempted by Satan, thereby setting up the final test of their virtue, whether caught in their errors they will convert or remain lost, as he makes clear by saying, but if you are oppressed by Satan and are persecuted and you do the Father's will, i.e. repent and convert, I say that he will love you and will make you equal with me and will consider that you have become beloved through his providence according to your free choice. Will you not cease then being lovers of the flesh and being afraid of sufferings? In other words, the devil has him right where he wants them, in relative comfort and enjoying worldliness. Or do you not know that you have not yet been mistreated, and have not yet been accused unjustly, nor have you yet been shut up in prison, nor have you yet been condemned lawlessly, nor have you yet been crucified without reason, nor have you been buried shamefully as I was myself, the word of God, by the evil one? But anyone who takes this position will go through all of these things, since the word yet lets us know that this is the price of conversion, as he goes on to explain. Do you dare to spare the flesh for whom the spirit is an encircling wall? If you contemplate the world, how long it is before you, and also how long it is after you, you will find that your life is but a single day, and your sufferings a single hour. For the good will not enter the world that is, the spirit is incompatible with worldliness. Scorn death, worldliness, therefore, and take concern for life. Remember my cross and my death, and you will live. And I answered and said to him, Lord, do not mention to us the cross and the death, for they are far from you. They didn't understand about the word. The Lord answered and said, Truly I say to you, none will be saved unless they believe on my cross. But those who have believed on my cross, theirs is the kingdom of God, therefore become seekers for death. Unless they are willing to die to their beliefs, they will not live, but those who will, will live. Just as the dead who seek for life, for that which they seek is revealed to them, the elect who believe in the hidden scriptures that were killed. And what is there to concern them? For they who have no stake in any prior religious affiliation, there will be little or no problem accepting this. When you turn towards death, it will make known to you election. In truth, I say to you, none of those who are afraid of death will be saved, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who have put themselves to death. When their reason diminishes, they will become full. Become better than I. Make yourselves like the Son of the Holy Spirit. Then I question him, Lord, how may we prophesy to those who ask us to prophesy to them? For there are many who look to us and seek to hear an oracle from us. They are unable to understand or to interpret the scriptures. The Lord answered and said, Do you not know that the head of prophecy was cut off with John? The Baptist, who represents the hidden books of scripture, which were cut off, the ones that will herald his second coming. And I said, Lord, it is not possible to cut off the head of prophecy, is it? We know what we're talking about, don't we? The Lord said, When you come to know what head is, and that prophecy issues from the head, then understand what the meaning of its head was removed is. 
These are the faculties of seeing, hearing, and speaking, which along with understanding are all requisites for the revealing of the mysteries of the scriptures. John's head was cut off because his condemnation of adultery in high places engendered hatred and a wicked scheme on the part of Herodias' wife, who through lust, social pressure, and a rash oath brought about his demise. I first spoke with you in parables, and you did not understand. Now, in turn, I speak with you openly, and you do not perceive. But it is you who were to me a parable within parables, and as that which is open in the words that are open. By parable within parables, he means that though they searched for the meaning of the parables, they were, in fact, themselves the subject of the parables, although they would never catch on until he disclosed it to them, such as this very letter is a parable about them without their having realized it yet. Be zealous to be saved without being urged. Rather, be ready on your own, and if possible, go before me. For thus the Father will love you. Be quick to repent and convert, and like John the Baptist, go before him to proclaim the good news of his second coming. Do not wait until judgment comes at last. Become haters of hypocrisy and evil thought, for it is thought which gives birth to hypocrisy. But hypocrisy is far from the truth. Let not the kingdom of heaven wither away by evil thought and hypocrisy. For it is like a date palm shoot whose fruits poured down around it. It put forth leaves, and when they budded, they caused the productivity of the date palm to dry up. Thus it is also with the fruit which came from this simple root. When the fruit was picked, fruits were collected by many harvesters. It would indeed be good if it were possible to produce these new plants now, for then you would find the kingdom. The date is a fruit, so it has the seed inside. The seed, when planted, will bring forth another palm. Therefore, there would have to be a passage of a considerable amount of time before another harvest. The leaves, the unfruitful growth of theology and organization within early Christianity, took all of the energy that was intended for fruitage and diverted it, thereby withering the tree. This is also a paradigm for Jesus' death and his going away. This is all part of his plan of salvation. Since I have been glorified in this manner before this time, why do you all restrain me when I am eager to go? You have constrained me to remain with you eighteen more days for the sake of parables. This would represent the time of harvest, when they realize that they are themselves the subject of the parables. It sufficed for some persons to pay attention to the teaching, and to understand the shepherds, and the seed, and the building, and the lamps of the virgins, and the wage of the workers, and the double drachma, and the woman. I won't attempt to interpret any of these here, but it is clear that while some people both paid attention to these parables and understood them, the Jews in the church did not. In another of my works, The Hidden Treasure, I explain some parables as meaning that the mystery of the kingdom would be lost and eventually rediscovered, and that bound up in it would be the reestablishment of the truth as contained in both the canonical and apocryphal books. So if some understood, then the church would itself be responsible for its loss. This is why Jesus exhorts them to become eager about the word. Become zealous about the word. For the word's first condition is faith, the second is love, the third is works. Now from these comes life, for the word is like a grain of wheat. When someone sowed it, he believed in it, and when it sprouted, he loved it, because he looked forward to many grains in the place of one. And when he worked it, he was saved, because he prepared it for food. Again, he left some grains to sow. Thus it is possible for you all to receive the kingdom of heaven. Unless you receive it through knowledge, you will not be able to find it. Therefore I say to you, be sober, do not go astray. And many times I have said to you all together, and also to you alone, James, he came to the Jews first, I have said, be saved, and I have commanded you to follow me, and I have taught you the response in the presence of the rulers the archons, the fallen angels, who are also known as the watchers. Observe that I have descended, and I have spoken, and I have troubled myself, and I have received my crown when I saved you. For I have descended to dwell with you in order that you may dwell with me. And when I found that your homes had no ceilings over them, I dwelt in houses which would be able to receive me when I descended. The elect ones who are to come will both believe and receive the word. 
Therefore obey me, my brothers. Understand what the great light is. The Father does not need me, for a father does not need a son, but it is the son who needs the father. To him I am going, for the father of the son is not in need of you, meaning religious institutions. Pay attention to the word. Don't ignore those who will be sent to you. Understand knowledge. Believe the interpretations they will give. Love, life, faith, love, and works. And no one will persecute you, nor will anyone oppress you other than you yourselves, meaning the churches and the synagogues will. But that is why he says that we are to lose our lives if we are to find them. O oh, you wretched! O oh, you unfortunates! O oh, you dissemblers of truth! O oh, you falsifiers of knowledge! O oh, you sinners against the Spirit! Do you even now dare to listen to the elect when it behooved you to speak from the beginning? Do you even now dare to sleep when it behooved you to be awake from the beginning, in order that the kingdom of heaven might receive you? In truth, I say to you that it is easier for a holy one to sink into defilement, and for a man of light to sink into darkness, than for you to reign, or even not to reign. I have remembered your tears and your grief and your sorrow. They are far from us. Now then, you who are outside the inheritance of the Father, weep where it behooves you, and grieve and proclaim that which is good, since the Son is ascending appropriately. In truth I say to you, had it been to those who would listen to me that I was sent, and had it been with them that I was to speak, I would never have descended upon the earth. And now then, be ashamed on account of them. Behold, I shall depart from you. I am going, and do not desire to remain with you any longer, just as you yourselves have not desired. Now then, follow me quickly. Here he is talking to those who will convert, that they should do so quickly, without hesitation. Therefore I say to you, for your sake I have descended. You are the beloved. You are those who will become a cause of life for many. Beseech the Father, implore God often, and he will give to you. Blessed is the one who has seen you with him when he is proclaimed among the angels and glorified among the saints. The Father who has used them despite their faults is a means of salvation to all who will repent and accept the truth. Yours is life. Rejoice and be glad as children of God. Keep his will in order that you might be saved. Take reproof from me and save yourselves. I intercede on your behalf with the Father, and he will forgive you much. And when we, the Christians and the Jews, heard these things, we became elated, for we had been depressed on account of what we had said earlier. They were no longer depressed, because when they perceived that God had used their errors as a means of salvation, they lost sight of the gravity of their sin. Now when he saw our rejoicing, he said, Woe to you who are in want of an advocate! Woe to you who are in need of grace! Many among them will imagine that since good will come as a result of their rejection of Christ, that their stubbornness will automatically be overlooked. But Jesus is letting them know that a sincere repentance is still necessary, and that they should bring forth fruit worthy of repentance by saying, Blessed are those who have spoken freely and have produced grace for themselves. Liken yourselves to foreigners. Of what sort are they in the estimation of your city? Why are you troubled when you oust yourselves of your own accord and depart from your own city? They abandon their place in the kingdom in order to establish their own. Why do you abandon your dwelling place of your own accord, readying it for those who desire to dwell in it? By readying it for those who desire to dwell in it, he means that because all of this is spelled out in parabolic language, in no uncertain terms, once the mystery is realized, that is revealed to the world by the Father, everything they have done or failed to do will mean the end of them and the beginning of a new people, who through faith in God's total power will be able to usher in the kingdom at last. O oh, you exiles and fugitives, woe to you, because you will be caught. Or perhaps you imagine that the Father is a lover of humanity. That is, he somehow intends for the world to remain as it is now. Or that he is persuaded by prayers. That is, prayers that reflect such a view. Or that he is gracious to one on behalf of another. Or that he bears with one who asks for fleshly things, as he goes on to explain. For he knows the desire and also that which the flesh needs. 
Is it not the flesh that desires the soul? Yet the body does not sin without the soul, just as the soul is not saved without the spirit. But if the soul is saved when it is without evil, and if the spirit is also saved, then the body becomes sinless. For it is the spirit which animates the soul, but it is the body that kills it. That is, it is the soul that kills itself. Truly I say to you, the Father will not forgive the sin of the soul at all, nor the guilt of the flesh. For none of those who have worn the flesh will be saved. For do you imagine that many have found the kingdom of heaven? If the kingdom of God is within us, as it says in Luke, and this corruptibility must put on incorruptibility, as Paul says, then we shouldn't be too surprised at these statements. He is still addressing Peter and James here, and he also called reason soul earlier, so actually he might also be referring to fleshly reason as opposed to spiritual intuition. Blessed is the one who has seen himself as a fourth one in heaven. Jesus has already indicated that we should become greater than him, and he also tells us in the canonical tradition that we shall do greater things than he did because he went to the Father. So if he is counted as one in heaven along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, then apparently it is his desire that we should become like him. If we recognize the authority he has given us as a new people, then we know his will become, as it were, his friends, who know what the Master is doing, thereby seeing him as he is, and thus becoming like him. When we heard these things, we became distressed. Now when he saw that we were distressed, he said, This is why I say to you, that you may know yourselves, and not, as it were, to frighten them with condemnation. For the kingdom of heaven is like an ear of grain, life, which sprouted in the field, the scriptures which were in the world. And when it ripened during the early church age, it scattered its fruit, life, and in turn filled the field, the scriptures, with ears of grain, life, for another year, the end of the age, the harvest of the world. You also be zealous to reap for yourselves an ear of life in order that you may be filled with the kingdom which is within. As long as I am with you, give heed to me and obey me, but when I am to depart from you, remember me, that is, after he has gone, remember that he is the word. And remember me, because I was with you without your knowing me. They did not know the word of God, even though it was in their presence as the hidden books. Blessed are they who have known me, because they could reveal it to the world. Woe to those who have heard and have not believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, but have had faith, because when they do see, they will believe all the more whereas the others would not. And once again I persuade you at the end of the age, for I am revealed to you, building a house which is very valuable to you, those who believe and convert. Since you take shelter under it, in the same way it will be able to support your neighbor's house when theirs is in danger of falling. Again, meaning the churches and the synagogues. In truth I say to you, woe to those on whose behalf I was sent down to this place, Blessed are those who are to ascend to the Father. Again, I reprove you, those who are in positions of power and authority. Make yourselves like those who are not, in order that you may come to be with those who are not. Do not let the kingdom of heaven become desolate among you. Do not become arrogant on account of the light which illumines. Realize that God is the one who has brought this about, so no one should become too proud because of his or her revelations. Rather, become to yourselves in this manner, as I am to you. For I have placed myself under the curse, in order that you may be saved. Peter answered and said, Sometimes you urge us on to the kingdom of heaven, and other times you turn us away, Lord. Sometimes you persuade us and impel us to faith and promise us life, and other times you expel us from the kingdom of heaven. The church doesn't realize that the blessing is founded on a curse. And the Lord answered and said to us, I have given you faith many times. Moreover, I have revealed myself to you, James, the Jews, and you have not known me. The Jews never accepted Christ. Again, now I see you rejoicing many times, and when you are elated over the promise of life, are you nonetheless glum? And are you distressed when you were taught about the kingdom? But you have received life through faith and knowledge. They are looking at it the wrong way, as a threat rather than a blessing, and therefore become defensive and are tempted to reject these things, as he goes on to explain. 
Therefore, scorn rejection when you hear it. But when you hear the promise, as in this very moment when you are hearing it, be the more glad. In truth I say to you, the one who will receive life and believe in the kingdom will never leave it, not even if the Father desires to banish him. This promise is so binding that God himself will not break it for any reason whatsoever. He says this so that our hearts may take comfort and approach without fear. These things shall I say to you for the present, but now I shall ascend to the place from which I have come. But you, when I was eager to go, have driven me, the word, out, and instead of your accompanying me, you have pursued me. Instead of preserving the mystery, they rejected it, and instead of preserving the hidden books, they destroyed and discredited them, and even though they were written in such a way that they ought to be misunderstood until the proper time, Jesus seems to be saying that they should have at least tried to understand and preserve them. But give heed to the glory which awaits me, and having opened your hearts, listen to the hymns which await me up in heaven, for today I am obliged to take my place at the right hand of my Father. Now I have said my last word to you. I shall part from you. The word as well as the understanding of it will leave the church and the Jews. For a chariot of wind has taken me up, and from now on I shall strip myself of the old understanding, in order that I may clothe myself with the new. But give heed. Blessed are those who have preached the Son before he descended, so that when I have come I may ascend the elect, along with the converts who will preach of his glory, and thus prepare the way for his coming. Thrice blessed are those who were proclaimed by the Son before they came into being, in order that you, James and Peter, may have a portion with them. The elect ones had been proclaimed by the scriptures thousands of years before their being called. The three blessings are the three testaments, and the third dispensation of the scriptures. They are called John, and decode like James and Peter. When he said these things, he went away, and we knelt down in repentance, I and Peter, the Jews and the Christians, and gave thanks, and sent our hearts up to heaven. We heard with our ears, and saw with our eyes the sound of wars, and a trumpet call, and a great commotion, the great tribulation. And when we passed beyond that place, we sent our minds up further, and we saw with our eyes and heard with our ears hymns and angelic praises and angelic jubilation. And heavenly majesties were hymning, and we ourselves were jubilant. After this, we also desired to send our spirits up to the majesty above. And when we ascended, we were permitted neither to see nor to hear anything. For the rest of the disciples called to us and questioned us. What is it that you have heard from the Master, and where has he gone? Is all life, and has disclosed to us children who are to come after us, since he has bidden us to love them, inasmuch as we will be saved for their sake. The Jews and the Christians should love the elect. And when they heard, they believed the revelation, but were angry about those who would be born, since it wasn't them, and it was far in the future. Then I, not desiring to entice them to scandal, sent each one to another place. But I myself went up to Jerusalem, praying that I might obtain a portion with the beloved who are to be revealed, because the Jews will finally accept Christ as the Messiah, knowing that he indeed does have the power to deliver them now. And I pray that the beginning may come from you, meaning the recipient of this letter, for thus I can be saved because they will be enlightened through me, i.e. this letter, through my faith, and through another's which is better than mine, the one who has the benefit of hindsight. For I desire that mine become the lesser, so that it can become greater through the power of God at the end of the age. Endeavor earnestly, therefore, to make yourself like them, and pray that you may obtain a portion with them. For apart from what I have recounted, the Savior did not disclose revelation to us, for their sake we proclaim, indeed a portion with those for whom it was proclaimed, those whom the Lord has made his children. There is a profound awe of God that knowledge of his greatness imparts. We can hardly be in profound awe of a God whose revelations are systematically misunderstood. P. 
Peter argues with Jesus about being full in this discourse. The church is convinced that it is in the right and is therefore blind to its mistake. As long as it holds that the hidden books are apocryphal, then there is no way for them to realize that they are inspired unless and until they are revealed. Early in the church age, none of these things would have made sense because they were written before the prophecies in them had come to fulfillment. If anyone at that time would have been able to explain it to them as what would come to pass, they would have been dismissed on the grounds that they were merely written to harm the church and would hence be branded as heresies. But, if after the passage of time, all trace of what they were supposed to mean becomes anathematized, then eventually no one would know the mystery anymore, which would allow for the prophecies to come to pass right under everyone's noses without anyone suspecting in the least what their true purpose was. No one can truly oppose God, because his understanding and power are limitless. If God is the source of all things, then all things should reflect that source. If these keys unlock the canonical scriptures and also the apocryphal books, then their source ought to be the same. This is the return to him. Whatever does not return to God is not from God, but returns to its own source. Having exhausted its usefulness, it returns to oblivion and is gone like a day that is past and cannot be called back into existence. God desires to overcome emptiness with fullness and fullness with emptiness. His words reflect his eternity, and they can finally be appreciated as the image of his glory. Not as words that can be spoken, but as words that speak to the eternity that he planted within us, who, finally able to receive the breath of life, once again become living beings.